So uh, what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about uh, you know, why, why neutron measurements and, and, and why Stuart was interested in those. And one thing you're going to see here is actually, uh, in a few cases, uh, Stuart was not measuring zero in this case, uh, luckily, because if he had measured zero when he was doing like the beta asymmetry, we would have been in big trouble. Um, but the, the, real, the big reason for doing these measurements is that uh, was looking for, in, in many instances, for tests of physics beyond the standard model. So you're trying to see if, if we could understand uh, non-standard couplings, for example, uh, th things of that nature. And, and that's one of the ones experiments I'll talk about at the end. Uh, the other thing is that you know, it turns out these, uh, the parameters for neutron uh, beta k a large number of the uh, weak interaction calculations rely on these parameters and they have to be measured with very good precision. And so uh, lots of things in, that, that we, you know, understanding a Big Bang nucleosynthesis, abundance of light elements, uh, many cross sections uh, across the board, and then uh, the weak interaction coupling strings. So what I thought I would do is I picked out four of Stewart's papers that, uh, sort of important papers, I'm going to kind of spend more time on this beta symmetry and a little bit more on the on, uh, T violation and uh, tell you a little bit about you know, the experiments and their impact and uh, uh, what we've learned from them. So I'm going to start with the uh, beta k asymmetry of a neutron and basically measuring the, uh, the vector um, and axial vector weak coupling constants. So the basic idea is that when you have neutron decay, that the parity violating nature of the decay uh, gives rise to this correlation between uh, the neutron spin and the emerging electron's momentum when one looks at that. And so if you have a longitudinally polarized neutrons, there's going to be this asymmetry between uh, that spin and number of electrons emerging parallel and anti-parallel. Uh, and, and so that was uh, one of the first experiments Stuart did, was working on in, in this particular area. This is a picture of him. Uh, Dirk Duber provided when he was working at Grenoble in the early 80s. Now, uh, in, in my own case, just in terms of meeting Stuart, I had met Stuart a couple of times, but it was kind of interesting because one of the things I remember, which you don't remember that many talks, you know, from uh, a quarter decade ago, back in, in 1986, I, I still recall going to the fall meeting, which was in Vancouver, and Stuart gave, you know, one of his typical, you know, really brilliant talks, and he talked about the physics that one can do with cold and ultra-cold neutrons. And he sp spent some time in this talk, you know, he talked about systematics, he talked about what you could learn in terms of precision weak interaction measurements, and he, you know, made the argument, this is a table, this is from the 1986 uh, particle properties, he, he, he sort of pointed out that this, this uh, beta symmetry parameter uh, had the advantage over uh, the lifetime that it was had very, very consistent measurement, and so it seemed to have less systematic problems. And he was using that as an argument for why you could combine this basically with the zero plus zero plus nuclear beta k's to get a, a, a value for j over gv. And, and from that, using that, from, from the j over gv uh, values from beta symmetry, you could combine that with this zero plus, and you would actually get the lifetime. At the time, the lifetime measurements were uh, very uh, in, in big discrepancy and disagreements between those experiments. So uh, what was the experiment they were working on? Well, they were doing what was called Percaeo, was the name of the spectrometer. And this is, uh, uh, the idea here was, uh, was actually very radically, this was a radically different experiment than what had been done before. Before, people had done coincidence experiments to look for this. And, and, and the idea they had was that, you know, and they were, again, we talked about it, about being very, very rate-limited experiments when in, in graduate school. Uh, the problem had been they were, rate, they, with the coincidences, they were rate-limited. And so the idea was to use cold neutrons here, uh, go through a polarizer, and then uh, longitudinally polarize these and have them decay in this volume of this superconducting spectrometer where you had uh, scintillation, uh, basically counters on one end and the other, so you could just look at this asymmetry. So this was a very, uh, you know, it was, a, it, was a, it was sort of a radical change in the way all those measurements had been made. Uh, this, is a, this is a picture of the apparatus, and uh, you, you know, Percaeo, you notice that Percaeo is used in the papers, and it's never really explained what Percaeo meant anywhere, it's just sort of there. Percaeo actually was sort of like the mascot around uh, Heidelberg, and it was uh, from the 18th century, it was a, a court jester. And uh, one of the things I learned from Stuart was that uh, this particular person 
would never say no to a glass of wine. And so the experiment was named, uh, you know, and again, they never really said why. I'm not sure why this apparatus was named that, but th this was the name of the experiment. In this picture, there's two interesting things uh, just to, to point out. Uh, one is that uh, this was a persistent magnet. You can see they had disconnected the leads here. And I really like their, their sort of high-tech way of telling if the magnetic field was on. You see these scissors over here. That's how they could tell that they were, they were actually working or not working. Now, the other, the other story, which is, uh, again, Stuart scrounging with, in, in Dirk Dubers. So it turns out that where they were, they had some uh, over here on where they were doing light insulation for their PMTs, they actually were using old inner tubes that were used uh, on uh, Dirk's uh, Citron car. And so Dirk pointed out to me, and you know, you know how much Stuart liked to tease people about various things. He said, you know, Dirk, you know, you're a really interesting guy. You like French cars and German food. <laughs> so the, the experiment that, that uh, you know, really with this four pi acceptance, they, they jumped up orders of magnitude and they made the most precise value measurement, about 2% measurement. Uh, overall of the beta symmetry, and then they got a new value, the most precise for J over GV. And this was actually the first experiment where you could actually see this V over C dependence that was predicted. Uh, that was the first time that was actually observed. And then they also, using the zero plus zero plus, they got out a neutron lifetime measurement that uh, was actually competitive at the time. And, and more importantly, maybe, was you know, by showing this technique worked, they launched a series of improved uh, Proteo measurements that have continued up till now. So this, you know, since this in the 80s, this has continued with further and further refinements. Now they also realized, uh, again, just thinking about how they could use this, this Proteo spectrometer was actually used for, I won't talk about it, for an axion search at one time. Uh, they were doing that. But they also, uh, they realized that if they, if they basically got a pulsed beam, so they had a, a velocity selector and a chopper, they could in fact do a lifetime measurement. So they tried this just to show the technique as well. So that was another uh, a measurement they made. Um, so, so I think where does this stand today and, and where do we, uh, you know, in terms of the, what do we know in terms of neutron decay? Um, and, and here on the left is a, a similar plot now for the GA over GV uh, uh, value. And here is the lifetime. And you can see that actually on the, uh, this was the measurement Stuart was involved in. This is the first Perkeo measurement. And, and there's been a big improvement. Uh, there was about a factor of four with Perkeo 2, and the most recent Perkeo is about a factor of eight improvement. So there's been a lot of improvements that have you know, been made. But if you look at the, the uncertainty here, what was kind of interesting uh, relative to the, the original idea here was that these, this idea that this particular uh, this beta symmetries kind of had all lined up. They certainly have not you know, been shown to do that. And there's, you know, there's really, you know, these experiments are really driven by systematics, sometimes by corrections. And so there's a lot of work going on. This is an area that continues uh, with uh, you know, different techniques like UCNA and others where people are trying to still you know, get this and reduce this error further. The lifetime is still, I won't go into you know, details, but the lifetime is still uh, you know, kind of, there are again systematic problems and, and one doesn't really understand uh, you know, where the problem is. Um, so just one quick aside on, on another measurement where he was not measuring zero, and this goes back to the comment that was made, uh, that, that Richard made about finding, you know, these little notes from John Bacall. John Bacall would write, all of us, I think, and sort of uh, encourage us to make certain measurements, and Stuart uh, took him up on one of these. This is the helium-3 and gamma measurement that they made in 1989, and this was in collaboration uh, with uh, Jeff Green at NIST. And, and the idea behind this experiment was that we know that in the sun there's a very rare uh, process where you actually got the so-called HEP process with a proton on helium-3. And in that particular, uh, that's supposed to be a subscript there, but anyway, uh, in that, that particular uh, process, uh, it has the highest endpoint. And, and, and at this time in 1909, the solar neutrino problem was still really unresolved. And one of the problems was that uh, you, you can't measure this. This is too difficult to measure directly at the, at the energies uh, one's trying to do this in the sun. And so one relies on effective field theory, but people realize that you can actually relate this helium-3 and gamma measurement. Uh, has got a lot of kinematic similarities, and in terms of um, 
the one body transition operators, it's actually got some, uh, a lot of overlap. This is sometimes called the HIN measurement. So anyway, at the time, there was really a factor two discrepancy. There was one measurement that said it was coming at 60 uh, microbarns and one at 30. So they realized that they could do this better, and they measured this cross-section uh, of, you know, about uh, 54, which uh, resolved that problem. And, and it's actually kind of nice because now we've made a lot of progress with effective field theories since that time. And so now when you're trying to do the calculations of the HEP, you can actually go back and calculate, and, and again, there's very good agreement between the effective field theories and this measurement as well. So now let me move on to an uh, experiment known as the EMIT experiment. I guess, again, this goes back to, uh, to maybe Stewart's graduate days where uh, looking at time reversal, this question is, uh, is, that, uh, is, there, is there time reversal violation in beta K? Uh, here's Stewart back here uh, looking at the spectrometer system that was part of the EMIT experiment. And, and I will say one thing here is that this is a good example, uh, the final paper here, which I'll talk a little bit about. But th this was a long process. So Stuart got involved with us. This, you know, so Tom Bowles, when I was at Los Alamos, had the idea that this was an experiment uh, worth, 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 worth trying to measure. And of course, it's very difficult. And uh, I, as a young uh, postdoc and then staff member, got real excited about it and said we should try to see if we could do this sort of experiment. Um, and we got, uh, there was a, a graduate student, Eric Wasserman, who was, was, was I, uh, essentially was a, a co-directed, and then he came out and worked with Stuart here uh, as a postdoc, and he did a, a, I'll show a little timeline, but he, he was involved in this, and then uh, we had Laura Leasing was one of Stuart's graduate students that worked on this experiment. And finally, there was an, uh, basically an interesting story, again, I think it's a legacy of Stuart, was, uh, was uh, Peter Mum, who uh, now is at NIST, uh, couldn't be here, unfortunately. Peter uh, was an undergrad who, again, went to Stewart and talked to Stewart about wanting to maybe do something. And, you know, as, as Peter says, Stewart saw something in him, and, and Peter uh, worked uh, with Eric and got involved in this experiment as an undergraduate, and then he was my student at Washington, and he went on to, as I say, do the final definitive measurement here. Um, so the uh, the idea behind time reversal violation is that, uh, you know, in the standard model, it would be uh, unbelievably small, totally non-observable, and uh, in terms of, of looking for it, nuclear beta decay. But you know, there are a number of uh, models beyond the standard model where you know we, we certainly know that we still don't understand the matter-antimatter asymmetry. Uh, we know there's something going on there. There can be non-standard model interactions, and it turns out that for for, for beta decay that the lepto quarks is a place where you can actually set a pretty good limit because neutron EDM can actually rule out some of these other experiments better. But uh, in terms of lepto quarks, the, uh, looking at beta K uh, is a very good way to do it. And again, uh, uh, you, know, you can have various contributions can arise, and uh, in particular from possible quark-lepton interactions. So they, you, you, they can be very, very sensitive experiments because there is so uh, it's such a small effect in the standard model that you might be able to see something. The, uh, the basic idea behind this experiment is that you, uh, you, you're looking for a, a triple correlation now, so you're looking at a correlation between the spin of the neutron and then the outgoing momentum of the electron and the proton. And uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, so we uh, started back with this test run and, and realized that this looks like this was going to work right. We figured out a way to optimize the geometry, to optimize our overall sensitivity to the effect. Some of the previous experiments had been done uh, where they were, they were optimized in some sense for the effect, but they didn't take into account with the weak interaction where you were actually going to be having most of your signal. And so we, we basically built something where we optimized the overall geometry for that, and we gained about a factor three increase over previous experiments. But as I said, it's very challenging, and there's a lot of issues related to systematics. So on this experiment, we, we started back, and so this was something where, again, you know, Stuart was uh, joined from the, from the start of this, and we did a kind of an R&D proof of concept with Eric Wasserman, and then Eric really deserves an enormous amount of credit for really thinking through this and then coming to Berkeley and getting this really underway. Uh, we then uh, ran an EMIT, you know, had our first result from you know, EMIT-1, which was, came out in 2000, and, and this was not at the level of sensitivity. We were trying to go about an order of magnitude uh, beyond where it had been done before. And then we did, you know, again, upgrades uh, and did a second run. 
and ended up uh, doing a, a blind analysis, which took us quite some time here. And then we wrapped this up uh, with the final result just uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, just to, to show you where we, uh, you know, it turns out this has become the most uh, sensitive uh, D coefficient in, in nuclear beta decay. Actually, before that, it was Frank Calaprice's uh, in terms of, of the nucleus was in neon 19. And so our goal was to get about to this point, and you know, this was what had happened back in the 80s, so it hadn't been worked on in a while. It is pretty difficult, and uh, our first measurement here, and the, the final result uh, right here, shown here. And so there is where we, uh, we didn't find anything. So let me, let me kind of wrap up with a couple of uh, uh, comments here. Uh, as you know about you know, working with Stuart and his sense of humor, so this was back from the Herkeo days. And you can see that uh, the students were uh, having fun with Stuart on that one. I'm sure he eventually extracted some amount of uh, uh, revenge. Uh, so what I thought I'd tell you about is I, I just was looking through my, 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 my emails uh, about certain things with Stuart, and I thought I'd share two little stories. Um, we were working on looking at the, and you'll, you'll hear a lot more about Corey in the next talk, Oliviera, but we were looking at schedules. And so I had Jason Detweiler working with me. Uh, and he was at Berkeley with Stuart Time. And we were calculating, kind of at, you know, estimating when we were going to see uh, uh, you know, when experiments would get results. And so I had, uh, I had kind of given, uh, you know, Stuart had some somewhat optimistic timing, and I had given Jason uh, a bit less optimistic timing and told him to do that. And so Stuart had wrote a very, very long email explaining uh, to me that, uh, that basically, or to Jason, but CCing me on all this, that, that, uh, that, that my schedule, the Wilkerson schedule, was a bunch of nonsense and how he had to use the Corey schedule. And actually, he was right, because I should have not have, uh, I, I should have used their schedule. It does turn out that my schedule was a lot closer. But, <laughs> so, I, so I sent this to Stuart, and I said, my sincere apologies that my initial estimate for uh, deployment was not correct. Jason's generating a new plot using your official Corey projections. And Stuart, you know, as you, people said, he doesn't always write you back. But he wrote me back and he, on, on something. He says, I just noticed this. He says, I will cherish this. This is the first sincere apology I have ever gotten from anybody. <laughs> I hope you understand the spirit of my message. I expect you know me well enough. So anyway, again, you know, well, you, you all know Stuart, so you know the meaning of that. Uh, and then one, one other one, which is, this was actually, when you're dealing with Stuart on things about funding, and, and, um, and you know, it's, it's much more fun to talk to Stuart about uh, physics. Occasionally, you have to deal with things on funding. And so we were having a discussion about some funding, and uh, Stuart wrote me back and told me that the tone of my email was hostile. And so anyway, so I said, I, I'm sorry if I seem hostile. I think a more accurate would be frustrated. It seemed to me, and I'm sure I was being unfair here, that you were giving me a bit of the runaround. <laughs> All right, so you can imagine, this, this is classic. Thanks for your kind message. Let me assure you, you should be sure you were being unfair. If I wanted to give you the runaround, you would never have suspected it. <laughs> So I'll just, I'll close and say, you know, obviously Stuart was certainly a superb physicist with dazzling breadth. Uh, you know, his, his neutron measurements, you know, he measured something and got it right. And uh, it was great fun working with him on that. There's actually a lot of people in this field today uh, doing neutron uh, physics, like, you know, Fred, who's here, and, uh, and uh, as well as, you know, uh, Brian, you know, Peter Mum, that, that were certainly, you know, stimulated by Stuart there. And I think that uh, you know, he certainly was a mentor, collaborator, colleague, and friend who is uh, very much missed. Thank you. <laughs>